My name is Professor Sarah Jones and I am PI on the AHRC funded network Culture and its Uses as Testimony, which for the past two years has been looking at the ways in which testimony is produced in and through different forms of culture, such as literature, film, media, videos, education, the law and so on. One of the outputs of the network is um, that we're now working with the National Holocaust Centre and Museum, the Holocaust Educational Trust, and the, Ho the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, and colleagues from the University of Nottingham to produce educational resources that hope to help teachers work with these different forms of testimony in the classroom. Um, so we've been looking at this from quite an academic perspective and um, have the privilege today uh, to get a quite different perspective on these questions. Um, so I'm going to be discussing um, the question of testimony um, and its use in different forms of culture with Ruth Barnett. Uh, Ruth uh, came to Britain on the kinder transport. Uh, she's the author of several books um, and campaign campaigns against injustice, discrimination and against war and genocide. Thank you, Ruth, for joining me today. Um, I wonder if you could start by telling us um, why you give your testimony and why you think testimony is important in education. Um, yes, thank you for inviting me. I'm very interested in this research project because uh, testimony is much more likely to engage people who might not otherwise be engaged in books and films. Um, so I think testimony is enormously important. Um, not long after uh, the kinder transport broke into the public domain at the uh, conference for the 50th anniversary, uh, of the coming to England, uh, the government put Holocaust education in the national curriculum without preparing the teachers beforehand, without preparing any teaching material, and uh, the teachers needed help. And I agreed to join a group going into schools to help the teachers and talk with the children and I found it was so much appreciated and necessary and fruitful that I wound down my psychotherapy practice gradually over quite a few years to have more time to go further afield than London. And now I go all over the country talking whenever I'm invited because I do think it's so important. I think it's important for another reason the youngsters are moving away from a face-to-face -face engagement. They are busy on their smart phones and um, I find it quite alarming, the statistics I read, of how much time they spend engaging with machines and how less and less time they spend engaging with people. So what do you think is important for students to know before they meet a survivor um, and what is it important for them to do afterwards? Um, beforehand it's useful if they have some background, a historical background um, in which uh, the event, the experience, the uh, testimony um, <coughs> giver is going to speak. <coughs> Afterwards, I think it's absolutely essential that particularly young people have a chance in smaller groups to discuss what it's left them feeling and thinking. Um, what do you hope it will leave them feeling and thinking? Well, when I speak, I like to throw some challenging material and I tell them that I don't expect them to agree with my opinion. They have to believe my story because I actually lived it. It's lived history. But when I tell them what I think, I want them to think. And I hope to leave them with a lot to think about. What role do you think empathy plays in that process of, of critical thinking about the survivor's testimony? Um, I think that's enormously important. When I talk to audiences, particularly younger children, primary children, I challenge them to think along with me. I 
tell them things like um, one of the first things the Nazis did in 1933 was to sack all the professionals who happened to be Jewish. My dad was a judge. He was told to go. He wouldn't go. He didn't see why he should go. He protested in his courtroom until the Gestapo came and frog-marched him out at the point of a gun. Now, can you imagine your dad, whatever his work is, can you imagine him being frog-marched out of his workplace at the point of a gun? That's what it was like under the Nazis. Um, and how important is it then um, that there's that face-to-face -face encounter with a survivor? You're also a writer of books. Um, what role can things like books and films and different kinds of media play in that process of, of getting students to think critically, of getting them to empathise? Um, I think books are important too because um, if you're really engaged and listening to someone speaking, you can't possibly remember it all. And once you've met a speaker, and enjoyed the feeling of being with them and engaged with what they're saying. Um, I think you want to read a book they've written for more and to remind you, perhaps the book will say the things over again uh, with more detail that they can engage with and remember and act on. And do you think fiction has a role to play in that regard? Uh, I, I often think about and uh, the role of f fiction. I think fiction definitely has a role, but um, I'm a little bit worried about how children, particularly very young children, actually react to some fiction that um, is very disturbing um, unless it's very carefully presented to them with an opportunity for checking out what they've understood. Because children can, children think very literally compared to adults. Um, they haven't yet um, sort of uh, got control of the idea of as if and linking that to their thinking. Um, so they can take it very literally. I'm thinking of the boy in the striped pajamas, mm -hmm. which should not be taken literally. Uh, it's a brilliant book for adults who know the story because it brings in the as if, what if, um, and gets them thinking. But I'm dubious whether it's um, suitable for primary children. Do you think it might have a role um, in teaching, um, perhaps not about the Holocaust, but about processes of discrimination um, and, that, and, and injustice mm. in secondary education, where perhaps students are able to do mm. as if mm. thinking? I, I think I definitely agree with you that um, themes of um, injustice and discrimination, um, various art forms, uh, not only literature but performing arts, can bring home truths that uh, just prose telling uh, doesn't quite, isn't quite as effective. That's why I've written the play about my family because uh, I think it really brings home the injustice, not only of the Nazi time, but the injustice of the middle Nazis, as I call them, the ones in pr the professional layer, who were just never sacked from their posts, never denazified. The denazification process was curtailed far too soon. And they were just cheerfully in their posts, carrying on in the same way as they did through the 12 years of the Reich. Uh, particularly in the legal profession, 
of the posts in the legal profession after the war were occupied by former Nazis who had never left their post. And would you hope that students might perform the play? I would be delighted if any school or university would like to take the play on. Um, I would give them all the help. Um, uh, with my, it was my son's idea, actually, because um, my father's story was first written as a novel by a German author who won a prize with the novel. It was then commissioned as a film on German television. And my book was translated into German, and I was invited to speak about my book. And I had huge audiences who just wanted to talk about the film. Uh, so my son had the idea that the real story should be told. And he suggested in the form of a play because he's always been interested in amateur drama. Mm -hmm. And I made a deal with him. I will write the play if you produce it. And he did last May with his amateur drama group in Liverpool. But all our friends in London wanted to see it, but weren't able to go to Liverpool, so I'm now trying to get it a bit nearer London. Um, <coughs> but, um, so it, yes. It's quite interesting, the range of different forms mm. um, that mm. have played a role in the telling mm. of your story and the story of your family. Um, what do you think makes for an authentic story, an authentic testimony? Well, that's a difficult one to answer. Um, that is where you have to hear it from the person who lived it. Um, it's very difficult to be uh, authentic with somebody else's story. My daughter complained about this for a long time. Uh, I had great difficulty persuading her don't think of it as my story. Think of it as the story of your family and tell it from your own point of view. And I think that's important. Um, I think it's important that whatever the testimony giver is saying is their own point of view. But they also need to make it quite clear what is their opinion and what are facts they're basing it on. The children need that particularly. What role do you think testimony in particular can play in creating a genuine culture of never again? Uh, I won't say it's absolutely essential because um, the knowledge is rapidly still being um, uh, increased through research and I think that will go on for a long time. Uh, the knowledge is there for people to go and get it and learn it and teach it but it does make it more easy to engage if you hear human beings giving testimony. Second and third generation who are starting to give testimony for their family, particularly if the survivors in their family are not uh, any longer alive or able to talk, um, need to make it their own story, their family history, so that they are speaking genuinely about how it's affected them. Uh, like my grandson, when asked what it was like having a granny uh, like me, who spoke to young people, um, thought for a moment and then said, well, I'm very well aware I wouldn't be alive if my granny hadn't been rescued. Um, so do you think that second and third generations are going to have an important role to play in Holocaust education in the future? I hope so, uh, because until um, humanity gets a handle on genocide and stops it, Holocaust education must go on. And it needs to go on in the context, the wider context of genocide. And the Holocaust needs to be represented either by second and third generation 
or by um, historians, researchers, but the ongoing genocide of the time also needs to be represented by people who are involved and who know and uh, accept what is happening and can talk about it, as well as a survivor of a post-Holocaust genocide who can give their actual experience. The past and the ongoing present need to be represented as well as a, uh, a survivor speaker. That is my opinion of what makes uh, a really powerful educational experience because I've, I've been on panels. So um, how would you hope that Holocaust education might look in, say, 10 years' time? Well, in 10 years' time, I doubt whether there will be any uh, Holocaust survivors still able to speak. So it will be the second and third generation. But not only them, there are other people who can represent the Holocaust the testimony of somebody who actually experienced genocide is hugely important, but the past needs representing and the current experience needs representing by somebody involved uh, because it needs to be represented before any survivors can be expected to be ready to speak. And I have witnessed um, survivors of post-Holocaust genocides being pressured into speaking before they're ready. And that is actually quite cruel because it can re-traumatise them. Ruth, I'd like to thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. It's been illuminating and you've um, given some really interesting perspectives on the questions that we've been thinking about. Thank you for inviting me. I found talking with you quite energising, which I like. And if you'd like to find out more about the, um, the network then, and also the resources that we are developing, then you can do so by visiting the website below. Thank you.